My name is Amy Henderson, and you're listening to the In the World podcast, where we use a Christian lens to analyze entertainment and media. Today, we are in the world of Les Miserables, the 1985 stage play adaptation of Victor Hugo's 1862 French novel about redemption, revolution, and romance. I was lucky enough to be a part of a theatrical production of this musical in 2006, and that experience has endeared me to the story ever since. I purchased the book last summer, and it is one of my favorite books on the shelf. I haven't read it, mind you, but it looks beautiful on my shelf. So, given my uncultured experience with the original work and dissatisfaction with any of the available film adaptations, we're going to focus on the musical version of the story, with which I am very well versed. So well versed, in fact, that I once sang the entire play from the beginning whilst in a haunted corn maze so as to keep myself from getting scared and assert my dominance over the creepy cast members trying to scare me. Good times. Back to business. The story of Les Mis is one that has charmed audience for decades and sparked amazing conversations about many Christian topics such as repentance, forgiveness, sacrifice, and our main topic for today, justice and mercy. The main questions I've considered regarding this topic are what is the purpose of justice and mercy and what is their relationship with each other? Stories from the scriptures as well as the story of Les Miserables provide some interesting and consistent answers worthy of discussion. So let's discuss. Normally, I would include a reasonable length summary of all the important points of the story for those unfamiliar with the play, but this show is really long and complicated, so if you haven't seen any version of it, I would recommend hitting up Wikipedia for a more comprehensive summary, if you're interested. The basic premise of the story follows Jean Valjean, a man sentenced to 19 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread and then trying to escape. He's released by a policeman named Javert, who is a stickler for the law and believes Jean Valjean will always be a thief. After a series of important events, which we will discuss more at length later, Jean Valjean turns his life around, but doing so requires him to break his parole, an action which turns Javert into the human version of Cujo, who then makes it his life mission to find Jean Valjean and exact justice for this new crime. Much happens, including Jean Valjean adopting the daughter of a woman named Fantine, who he accidentally wronged. There's also an upheaval in the government, which results in a mini French Revolution take two. Jean Valjean spends most of the next 15 years in hiding from Javert, trying to protect his adopted daughter Cosette, but he briefly participates in the revolution and ends up saving Javert's life. Unable to reconcile his beliefs that Jean Valjean is a bad person with personal experience that proves otherwise, Javert commits suicide. In the end, Cosette gets married, and Jean Valjean is greeted by the spirit Fantine, who essentially sings him a more academic version of the chorus of Carry On Wayward Son by Kansas, and confirms that he has been forgiven and can now rest in heaven. The musical has all the complexities and gray areas of real life mirrored in its plot, and it's based on real events. Early on in my introduction to this musical, keep in mind I was 16 at the time, I consider Javert to be the main antagonist of the story. I mean, he does hunt down Jean Valjean for basically the whole play over a paltry crime. However, on further reflection over the years, I came to see Javert as more of a contagonist, someone who gets in the way of the main protagonist, but not the direct evil in the story. In truth, I see the main conflict of the story more as a man versus self or man versus society, and both Jean Valjean and Javert are victims of this conflict, just from opposing sides. Those opposing sides manifest themselves in a number of different ways, but I've always been drawn to the struggle between justice and mercy. For a long time, I followed the obvious interpretation of Javert being the poster child of all justice, and Jean Valjean being the advocate of all mercy. And that still makes some sense in a rudimentary way. The commonly simplified definition of justice is administering due punishment for misconduct, and the simplified definition of mercy is essentially mitigating punishment for misconduct. Javert and Jean Valjean certainly fit into those categories in a general way, but recently I've decided that justice and mercy are not as simple as that. Justice and mercy are often regarded as opposites. We can either be merciful or we can be just. I mean, how can you administer punishment and mitigate it at the same time? But God is both just and merciful. As Christians, we are taught that the atonement of Jesus Christ took place as a way to satisfy the demands of justice so that God could be merciful towards us when we sin. This didn't mean we get off scot-free. It simply affords us the opportunity to repent and repair our wrongs. It is the defining event that gives us the opportunity to change, which has led me to our core question for the day. What is the purpose of justice and mercy? 
If the atonement of Jesus Christ is what gives us the opportunity to change, then where do justice and mercy fit into that equation? To answer that question, let's zoom in on a scene from Les Mis. At the beginning of the story, Jean Valjean can't find meaningful employment after being released from prison because his yellow parole card identifies him as a criminal. So, believing there is no other option, he steals some silver from a priest who gives him shelter for the night. Upon being arrested for the theft, Jean Valjean asserts that the silver was a gift from the priest, and is shocked when the priest confirms that story is truth. Not only that, but after the police leave, the priest actually lets Jean Valjean keep the silver so he can use it to become an honest man. The common interpretation of this exchange is that the priest is merciful. And he is, mercy in its reduction being a refrain from punishment. But I want to focus on the result of this exchange. What happened after Jean Valjean is given the second chance? Well, he has a beautiful musical soliloquy in which he expresses incredible pain and guilt for what he's done, and those feelings motivate him to escape from the world of sin he's lived in and start over. In short, he changes. He improves. Now, before we reach a conclusive interpretation of this scene, let's look at an example from the Bible that exemplifies a more justice-centered approach. In Acts 9, we read the story of Saul, who persecuted the saints of God. On his way to Damascus, he encounters a bright heavenly light and hears a voice which rebukes him for his treatment of the followers of God. And he's struck blind for three days and doesn't eat or drink. This to me is a very clear example of what I would consider justice in its reduction, punishment for his previous actions. But the outcome of this story is the same as the scene in Les Mis. Saul changes, he improves. So what if the purpose of justice and mercy are actually the same? What if they aren't opposites at all, but complements? Two different but complementary components of an equation which has a simple outcome. To encourage change and reform. Let's consider it in the form of an equation. Just some simple algebra, don't panic. If you think about the equation x plus y equals 100, there are 100 different combinations of numbers that could produce the correct answer. If x represents justice and y represents mercy, then these variables can be combined in any number of ratios to achieve the desired outcome, which is a desire to change. In the case of Jean Valjean, it seemed that a heavier dose of mercy was needed to change his behavior. Obviously, the only justice approach of being in prison didn't create change, and it wasn't until the priest offered mercy to him that Jean Valjean decided to really improve his life and behavior. It is important to note that the priest didn't say, stealing is okay, don't worry about it, bro. He acknowledged the behavior was wrong and encouraged him to do things differently. Similarly, the justice of Saul's blindness on his trip to Damascus actually produced a desire for change in Saul's behavior in a way that mercy itself might not have accomplished. But there was mercy too. The blindness only lasted three days and Saul was introduced to Ananias, who helped him come to know God. Each person received what he needed in order to have the desire to start on the path towards reform and redemption. Based on this idea of justice and mercy being complements and harmony towards an end goal, it's important to address the extremes of this equation that we often default to. Back to the maths. Same equation as before. X plus Y equals 100. X is justice, Y is mercy. And technically, there is the option of having 0 plus 100 equals 100 and 100 plus 0 equals 100 essentially all justice or all mercy. But I would argue that these are impossible equations in our analogy because they reduce justice and mercy to their extremes, and those extremes cannot produce the desired outcome. These extremes are legalism and permissiveness. Legalism being the strict adherence to rules or laws regardless of their ethics, and permissiveness, accepting behavior without consequence. Javert, though commonly thought of as an advocate of justice, is actually a greater advocate for legalism. He follows the letter of the law regardless of its damage and harm. The system itself is unjust. This is made incredibly clear throughout the play, so it's arguably impossible to be fair and just within the system. This is part of the reason we don't like Javert. He is supporting a broken and corrupt system in the name of good intentions. But if the opposite extreme of legalism is permissiveness, is Jean Valjean its representative as an all-mercy kind of guy? Not really. Let's look at a couple scenes. First, where Javert's been captured and Jean Valjean decides to let him go instead of killing him. We might see this as a completely merciful act. Permissive, if you will. I mean, Javert has been a raving lunatic for two hours, that's more than 30 years in musical time, and has woefully misunderstood every single thing Jean Valjean has done since the opening number. He's implacable. So letting him go without any conditions, bargains, or petitions seems very merciful. 
But Jean Valjean, like the priest with him previously, is very precise. You are wrong. You always have been wrong. He then goes on to say, there's nothing that I blame you for. You've done your duty. Nothing more. He recognizes that, according to the law, which is dumb but still the standard of evaluating justice, Javert has carried out his duties. And aside from having a singularly focused vendetta against one man, Javert hasn't actually done anything that was beyond the scope of his assignment. So it is, in fact, just for Jean Valjean to let him go, given the system to which he knows Javert is accountable. But he does so with a firm and unwavering assertion that even though he's done his duty, he is wrong. Granted, there is a lot of mercy and forgiveness in this scene, but Jean Valjean is not permissive of Javert's hatred. He admits the complexity of his actions, but he never validates his erroneous and misguided view of Jean Valjean's life and behavior. In another earlier scene, we see Jean Valjean promise to care for Fantine's child, Cosette, when she dies. This, again, feels very merciful, a man being willing to become a father to a stranger's child. But while this is very merciful to Fantine and Cosette, it is more just than merciful for Jean Valjean. He is partially responsible for Fantine getting fired and having to resort to prostitution in order to support her child, and that occupation is what made her sick, got her arrested, and in the end killed her. There is more justice in this action than mercy for himself, but still, we like it. It feels right. These two examples are only a few from the story that show how Jean Valjean is correctly using the equation of combining justice and mercy, and isn't permissive. This balance of justice and mercy is tricky because not sure if y'all have noticed, but we're not perfect. None of us. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said that imperfect people are all God has ever had to work with. That must be incredibly frustrating for him, but he deals with it. The system in which we currently live, the society in which we live, is imperfect. Alert the media. Is it therefore possible to be completely fair if the system itself is not designed that way? Maybe not. That's why God's system works. According to Elder Dale G. Renland, the commandments of God are neither a whimsical set nor an arbitrary collection of imposed rules meant only to train us to be obedient. They are linked to our developing the attributes of godliness, returning to our Heavenly Father, and receiving enduring joy. And what makes God just is the consistency of his commandments. They apply equally to all. That is justice. Same rules for everyone. This is where our x plus y equals 100 equation becomes inadequate. Because God's justice is fixed, but his mercy is individual, the outcome is always perfect. I'm sure there is some kind of equation that could include all the other variables, but I am far too inadequate as a mathematician to figure it out. But he factors in everything. Our experiences, our personalities, our strengths, our weaknesses, and he puts it all into the equation of justice and mercy at the perfect ratios to give us the best chance to make the decision to change. The scriptures provide a lot of examples where God enacts justice as the brunt of his response to the actions of man. But that justice is always coupled with mercy, and our crime-fighting duo are always looking to open the door to change. The story of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, is a prime example. Alma the Younger from the Book of Mormon, Jonah and the Whale, Adam and Eve, all stories of justice followed by mercy. But there is an important choice we cannot overlook here. In Alma 42.23, it says that mercy claimeth the penitent. Insert appropriate Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade line here. But that feeling of regret and humility is the key to the mercy of God, and it is often, though not always, the key to our willingness to offer mercy to others. Reduced, are you sorry? When we are truly penitent, we open ourselves up to the incredible mercy of God. Elder Renler reminds us that no matter how long we've been off the path or how far away we have wandered, The moment we decide to change, God helps us return. When we are willing to change, we are granted freedom from our past mistakes, which in turn gives us the freedom to move forward towards redemption. In the case of Les Miserables, we almost always agree with the choices Jean Valjean makes. I say almost because no one's perfect and absolutes are illogical. But generally speaking, especially when it comes to interactions with Javert, we take his side. Why? It's because he's both just and merciful. It's the balance of justice and mercy and a desire to start on or stay on the straight and narrow path that we agree with. I'd like to note an interesting observation I had while thinking about this play and how I felt the first time I saw it. In works of fiction, we want people to make the right choices. We believe they can. We are rooting for them to be good and do what's right. Every time someone makes a wrong decision, we're disappointed, but we're hopeful that they will do better. But in real life, we're often slow to believe other people are capable of real change. 
we expect the worst. We demand justice for misconduct, and we're hesitant to be merciful. And no, I am not suggesting that we will ever be as perfect as God in determining what ratio of justice and mercy will be the most helpful in creating lasting change in other people. But maybe that should be the question we ask. If our purpose is truly to change behavior and not simply get revenge or enact punitive punishment, what is the right balance of justice and mercy to motivate that mighty change of heart? Les Miserables is an incredible story, and the music in the stage production only amplifies its message with glorious harmonies. Even as a story out of history, it's an impressive reflection of the world we live in right now. It carries a powerful admonition to love others, forgive ourselves, be the change we want to see, and it gives insightful examples for how we can better be in the world, in the horrors and injustices of the world, without being a part of it. Thank you for tuning into the In the World podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review or share the episode with your family and friends. I hope you'll join us next time as we find new entertainment and media to examine through a gospel lens.